I'm going to talk to you about the uh, treatment of a ureteral stone, um, and I'm going to tell you what the AUA guidelines say and compare and contrast them to the EAU guidelines because I think that would be fairly, fairly useful. Um, my disclosure in regards to this is I was a member of the AUA uh, guideline, Surgical Management of Stones, which was published in 2016. So before we get there, I went out to the National Elk Refuge yesterday, and I learned a few things that I wanted to share with you. We already heard from Dr. Holzberlein and Dr. Mulhall how important testosterone is for our humans, males. Well, it turns out the elk need testosterone too. That's how they grow their antlers. And the bigger their antlers are, the more likely it is for the females to pick them for mating. And when they mate, their testosterone goes up a thousand times. Now, you might think that that would make them the more dominant um, compared to the females. But in fact, the elk are a matriarchal society and the females lead the herd. And in fact, the guide said that in the migration route, if the females didn't lead them, they would starve to death because they couldn't find their way to the bottom. <laughs> what does it have to do with ureteral stones? Nothing, but I thought it was fascinating. I just wanted to share it with you. Okay. So I think the best way to talk about guidelines is to do it in a case-based uh, um, way. So here's a patient of mine, 55-year-old female, right flank pain, nausea, vomiting, classic symptoms to the ER. This is the CT. You can see about a 6, 7 millimeter right distal ureteral stone, um, but normal renal function, afebrile. What do the guidelines say to do with this patient? Both the EAU and the AUA guidelines recommend observation in this patient. Uh, the difference between them is that the AUA guidelines will say less than 10 millimeters and the EAU guidelines will tell you six should be your cutoff. What is this based on? Well, the smaller the stone is, the more likely it is to pass. Here are the 95% um, passage rates based on size and days. And actually, Derricott Vaughn and Jay Gillenwater did a study back in the 70s saying that if you completely occluded the ureter, uh, this is a canine experiment, you got no return of renal function after six weeks, and a lot of our decision on when to end medical expulsive therapy or observation is based on that study. So if we do a trial of passage, what do we have to think about? Pain control? Are we going to use medical expulsive therapy, and how long is it going to, 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 ha to occur? So I think the EAU guidelines are ahead of us in this regard, and I think to some degree that's because they are updated more frequently than ours. So this is, they were updated in 2019. Um, <clears throat> they essentially show that using level 1B evidence, non-steroidals are absolutely superior to opiates in the management of acute renal colic. And that is the take-home point here. Non-steroidals first, opioids second. I don't think I have to tell anyone in this room we have an opioid epidemic in the United States. It's very much based on geography and how we prescribe. In fact, it's been shown that new persistent opioid use after outpatient uteroscopy in opioid-naive patients is about 6%. And what, what predicts them to be um, persistent users is how much they were prescribed at the time of their episode. Ryan C., my partner, and I looked at this as well. We, in Tennessee, we have a controlled substances monitoring database, so we could actually look at our ureteroscopy patients and try to determine what, went on, what led them to use them persistently at 30 and 60 days, and we were actually able to show the preoperative opioid exposure, number of prescriptions they got, the number of days that you prescribed them, and how many unique providers predicted persistent use. Well, what about medical expulsive therapy? Who in the audience uses medical expulsive therapy all the time? Who never uses it? Who uses it for distal stones? All distal stones? Bigger distal stones. Okay, you're following the guidelines. So the medical <laughs> expulsive therapy, you know, it's been, it's been all over the place. But suffice to say, the AO guidelines will say for distal stones that are less than 10 millimeters, MET with alpha blockers is recommended, and in the EAU guidelines, um, I agree with the strong recommendation for alpha blockers for distal ureteral stones greater than five millimeters. Well, where did this sort of controversy around medical explosive therapy come from? The SUSPEND trial is one everyone talks about. It was published in Lancet. It's a multi-center European study that showed there was no difference if you gave alpha blockers. The problem with the study was that it predominantly had distal small stones. A lot of these stones were going to pass spontaneously anyway. So there were some, some issues with the study. Um, the AUA guidelines, we actually did a meta-analysis, were able to show that uh, for stones that were less than 10 millimeters, alpha blockers were better than placebo. And in fact, if you looked at specifically the use of tamsulosin and distal ureteral stones, that's where your greatest effect was going to be. There's really no good evidence for mid or proximal stones. 
Well, how about the distal stone? What other studies have been shown that um, correlate well with what we saw in the uh, meta analysis? These are clearly studies that were included in the meta analysis that we did. Um, so the impact of distal ureteral stone size was shown um, in this Australian study. If you had a distal stone of 5 to 10 millimeters, your chance of passing the stone with tamsulosin was 83% versus only 61% with um, placebo. And again, also shown in this multi-center double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Larger stones, greater than five millimeters, were, it was a benefit to give MET. Uh, this is just to show you for mid and proximal stones in the AUA meta analysis, there's no benefit in these forest plots. Okay, so let's change the scenario. Same case, same patient, but she comes with a fever of 101, her creatinine's one and a half, and she's a diabetic. I don't think there's anyone in this room that would observe the stone in this case. I hope, I hope you wouldn't. So if you suspect infection in an obstructing stone, both the EAU and the AUA guidelines tell you you must intervene to decompress the collecting system. Um, and I think the take-home point here is it doesn't matter what you do. Stent is fine, nephrostomy tube is fine. Whatever you can do faster is what you ought to do. Um, I think that's going to depend on what, your, uh, what the scenario is in your hospital. So what about definitive stone management? Let's say a patient fails MET or observation. Uh, we, the duration, as I said, the AUA guidelines say you shouldn't observe a stone more than four to six weeks. Um, if you're going to take someone to the operating room, both guidelines say you have to have at least a urinalysis. A urine culture is preferred, uh, but at least a urinalysis. And I would tell you, in the setting of an obstructing stone, beware of discordance between what's proximal to the stone and what's in the bladder. Many times, what's proximal does not match what, what's growing in the bladder. So I almost always take culture proximal to the stone um, in these sick patients. So for the sake of the guidelines, the AUA guidelines um, break up the ureter into uh, proximal, middle, and distal with regards to stones, and the EAU guidelines just proximal and distal. It is a clinical principle that if you um, are going to take someone to the operating room and you have any suspicion that the stone has moved or passed, you really should image them and keep it to the region of interest. You should inform patients that shockwave is the procedure with the least morbidity and the lowest complication rate, but ureteroscopy has the greater stone-free rate in a single procedure. Both guidelines will say that. Here's really how the complications break down between shockwave and ureteroscopy. I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer, right? If you're not putting anything inside a patient, your risk of perforation, stricture, or emulsion are going to be zero compared to ureteroscopy. So let's start with middle and distal ureteral stones. For the AUA guidelines, stones are breaking, ureteral stones are breaking, broken down to less than 10 millimeters and greater than 10 millimeters and then based on location. So the AUA guidelines say for middle and distal ureteral stones, both greater than 10 millimeters and less than 10 millimeters, ureteroscopy is preferred and recommended. The EAU guidelines differ somewhat and say for stones that are greater than 10 millimeters in the, middle, in the distal ureter, ureteroscopy is preferred. But for stones that are less than 10 millimeters, the really equivalent results for shockwave and ureteroscopy. So that's one difference between the two guidelines. And this is the meta-analysis that was done. Uh, by the AUA, you can see for middle stones, 91% versus 75%, the ureteroscopy is in red, and also superior rates for distal stones. For greater than one centimeter stones, again, better superior rates, uh, stone-free rates for uh, ureteroscopy compared to shockwave with tripsy. What about the proximal stone? The um, AUA guidelines, again, are recommending ureteroscopy, although we recognize that the best data is for stones less than one centimeter. Um, the EAU guidelines really, again, differ in the sense that they agree that for proximal stones greater than 10 millimeters, ureteroscopy is preferred, but in less than 10 millimeters, the, um, the results of shockwave and ureteroscopy are pretty equivalent. And again, here's just showing you the AUA uh, guidelines panel made analysis, showing you for less than one centimeter proximal ureteral stones, 85% versus 67%. And in greater than one centimeter stones, you can see the bars are much smaller, 79% versus 74%. What about non-index stones? It's an expert opinion by the AUA guidelines that if you have a cysteine or a uric acid stone, that ureteroscopy would be preferred, predominantly because cysteine doesn't respond to shockwave very well, and both stones can be difficult to target uh, on uh, shockwave with tripsy. 
If you have a patient with an uncorrected bleeding diathesis, this is a patient of mine with a mid to proximal ureteral stone who had antithrombin-3 deficiency, uh, history of DBT and PE could not be taken off of these medications. He's someone we're not going to give shockwave lithotripsy to. He's somebody who should get ureteroscopy. And you can actually do it very safely on anticoagulation. Safety guidelines, there's no evidence for this, but I think it's, a, it's expert opinion in both guidelines that a safety guidewire should be used for most endoscopic procedures. I will tell you, in my own practice, if it's a ureteral stone I'm treating, I always use a safety guidewire. If I'm working in the kidney with an access sheath, I do not always use a safety wire. So we can talk about that later, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the critique panel. I think this is one place where the AUA and EAU guidelines really do differ. The AUA guidelines do not think you should routinely put a stent in before you read oroscopy. It is well recognized that the stone-free rates are better if you do, but the added cost and the negative impact of stents on patients, uh, we really didn't think that that was enough to warrant doing pre-stenting. The EAU guidelines differ. They really think that pre-stenting is strongly recommended uh, to increase stone-free rates. Well, what about after treatment? We talked about this in the critique panel yesterday. There is really good RCT data, level one evidence to say you do not need to put a stent in after you read oroscopy. This was an old study, 2001, John Denstead and John Honey were able to show that uh, you know, if you put a stent in, their urinary symptoms were terrible compared to if you didn't, but their complications were no different. Um, and so if you have these items, based on the AOA guidelines, present, meaning uncomplicated, so no ureteral injury, no anatomic impediment or distal obstruction, normal contralateral kidney and kidney function, and no plans for secondary procedure, you can omit a stent. Okay? Is there anyone putting stents in routinely for shockwave latripsy? Good. It does not help. Uh, so it will actually decrease your stone-free rates. Putting a stent in for uterostomy does not prevent Steinstrasse. It only prevents the obstruction related to Steinstrasse. And if you are getting Steinstrasse from shockwave, you're shocking a stone that's too big. <clears throat> what about stent symptoms and uh, facilitating the passage of fragments? Both guidelines recommend the use of alpha blockers in both of these scenarios. So, and this is also level one evidence. Uh, this is based on randomized controlled trials. The AUA guidelines go a step further to recommend anti-muscarinics as well. Um, I think this is a good opportunity to talk about non-narcotic agents for pain control. Uh, this is from a meta-analysis looking at alpha blockers and anticholinergic therapy, both of which have been shown to be beneficial. Um, and I think, you know, this is something we became very interested in. Uh, we did a recent study where we developed uh, enhanced recovery after surgery protocol, something that Jeff had talked about, um, for our ureteroscopy patients. Our goal was to improve their recovery but also significantly reduce our narcotics uh, prescribing. So we did a prospe prospective observational study where we had a run-in period where patients, um, we just gave them whatever we were traditionally giving them. And then we instituted the ARIS protocol, and in both groups, um, we measured not only outcomes, but also we used quality of life instruments, the PROMISE pain intensity 3A, which looks at the, the intensity of pain, and the PROMISE patient interference 6B, which looks at how much the pain from the stent may have interfered with their quality of life and activities of daily living. So this is what the protocol looks like. So patients coming for ureteroscopy in the pre-op holding area, they're getting acetaminophen and gabapentin. Gabapentin has been used a lot in the uh, uh, colorectal surgery space. They then go into the operating room, we give them a BNO suppository before we insert the scope, and they get Ketorolac uh, 30 milligrams. They get completely narcotic-free anesthesia. Um, for the sake of this study, we standardized our stent placement. My partner really likes 4.8 French stents, so we put 4.8 French stents in, and we left them for a duration of about four to seven days. When they hit the recovery room, they got no narcotics routinely. If they needed pain control, tramadol was the first choice, and then opioids after that. And then this is their discharge re regimen, no narcotics. So alternating Tylenol and ibuprofen, we gave them oxybutynin uh, and tamsulosin. We contacted them at 48 hours uh, and completed the quality of life QOR 15, which just looks at how well they recovered from surgery. And then we, we um, recorded un unanticipated episodes of care because we really wanted to see if what we were doing was making a difference, positive or negative. 
So if a patient called in, we institute what we call an escalation protocol. So the first thing is figure out, are they following the protocol the way that we recommended it? For some reason, people think a lot of times that over-the-counter medications are not as effective as ones that are prescribed. So we actually prescribe the ibuprofen and Tylenol with a written prescription. Um, we then, uh, if, they, if they were following the protocol and their pain intensity was greater than four out of 10, then we again gave them tramadol rather than narcotics. And for this study, we used the CSMD to look at all opioid prescriptions, because if they, if they weren't getting it from us, they could easily have been getting it from someone else. And then we compared the two groups. We did 28 in the run-in period and 52 in the uh, ARIS protocol. There's really no difference between the groups and sort of their preoperative data. But as you might expect, if we didn't give them any narcotics in the ARIS protocol, the amount that they took was significantly less than what we were giving before. We were giving 93% of our patients narcotics before we instituted this protocol. And I think the take home in this table is there was no difference in unanticipated episodes of care. There was no difference in calls or refills or need for uh, more narcotic in either group. Here's a look at the QOL. There was a slight difference in the preoperative 3A, PROMS 3A score, slightly higher scores in the uh, pre ARIS group. But post ARIS, slight trend towards greater uh, scores in both the PROMIS 3A and 6B for the ARIS group. But for PROMIS, in order for it to be clinic clinically significant, you have to have a difference of five uh, in the T score, which was not what we saw. So we thought while this uh, there was a difference here. We didn't think it was clinically significant. So here are my take-home messages. MET for distal ureteral stones greater than five millimeters. Trial of passage no longer than six weeks. Shockwave, lowest morbidity, least lowest complication rate, but ureteroscopy, highest stone-free rate. Ureteroscopy for special cases we discussed. Ureteral stent unnecessary for uncomplicated cases. There's been a survey that said 93% of us put them in anyway. We could talk about that more. Um, and I think multimodal therapy for stent pain can significantly reduce narcotic usage. Um, and I think this is, this is really where we're headed. Um, so I thank you. This is my buddy, Max. He was the one who took me out to see the elk yesterday. If you haven't done this, he's a Percheron. He's so sweet. I don't know what that other guy's trying to do, but get me in the back, I guess. But um, if you haven't done it, it's a wonderful tour. I would really recommend doing it. It takes about an hour of your time. So thank you.